Welcome, I'm Sergeant Rachel Badgley. This is Soldier's Journal. Thank you for joining us as we cover stories that are all about you, the soldier. In this edition, we go to Colorado to see Colorado and Wyoming Army National Guard soldiers rescue hundreds of people stranded by recent floods. We get a soldier's perspective on being part of an airborne unit. But first, the White House announced Monday that former Army Captain William Swenson will receive the Medal of Honor for his courageous actions during the 2009 Battle of Ganjgal Valley. On September 8, 2009, Captain William Swenson and a joint combined team of U.S. and Afghan forces came under enemy fire during combat operations in Kunar Province, Afghanistan. What went wrong? In war, one always has a plan. You have an expectation of what the outcome will be. On that day, as usual, the plan changed. The outcomes changed. Captain Swenson was a mentor embedded in Afghanistan. His mission was to help the Afghan forces understand their American counterparts. The captain was part of a contingent on their way to meet with the village elders in Gunjagal when Taliban forces ambushed the mission. Well, as we approached the village, we received contact. At first, the contact was sporadic, and this is where we started trying to use, utilize the effects of artillery to mitigate the enemy's ability to maneuver on us. Enemy forces dealt out an arsenal of attacks ranging from rocket-propelled grenades, mortars, and machine guns. Captain Swenson led a group of Marines and Afghan forces into enemy fire multiple times to search for the wounded. Returning to the kill zone a final time, Captain Swenson and others again exposed themselves to recover three fallen Marines and one Navy corpsman. Could I have done anything different? No. But could I always hope that the outcome could have been different? Yeah. Hopefully, nobody else ever has to feel that outcome. And that's the important thing from that day, what we learn, how we move forward. His leadership effectively disrupted the enemy's assault and ensured accountability of team members. For his bravery above and beyond the call of duty, Captain William Swenson will be presented the Medal of Honor by the President at a ceremony in the White House on October 15th. Captain Swenson will be the sixth living recipient to be awarded the Medal of Honor for actions in Iraq or Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, dismounted patrols are effective in finding the enemy, but they also provide the opportunity for soldiers to meet and acquaint themselves with the local population. Sergeant Carl Greenwell heads outside the wire and files this report. It's the middle of the night in Afghanistan, and most people are resting. But 3rd Platoon Ghost with the 2nd Cavalry Regiment is on a 24-hour patrol to keep everyone safe through the night. We're going to link up with the ANP. And then we're going to do a dismounted patrol for about an hour through Manisar. We'll bring the dogs with us, so uh, just kind of see what there is to see. Typically, we only go into here when we're doing a quarantine and search, so we're just kind of trying to change it up. It's good to do a patrol like this just so people feel our presence. Uh, is, this, is this a home right here? Who lives here? So they feel uh, dissuaded against doing any... ID making or rocket facilitating. Okay, be advised, we've circled the compound. We're heading east. We're about to get eyes on you. We're approaching this taxi cab looking vehicle. Dismounted patrols are vital to any mission. Besides showing a presence to the enemy, they also give U.S. forces and ANP a chance to talk to locals and gather valuable information leading to Taliban or other insurgent operations in the area. While most villages only have one resident tribe, Mandizar is important because it plays host to various tribes and people wandering the countryside. So building a relationship here is essential. I think the local population is really crucial. I think sometimes we get a little too focused on going after the enemy, but the real key is that if you look at it on a spectrum where you have insurgents on one end and you have people that are very pro-government, very pro-coalition forces, there's a whole spectrum of people in between there that I think when we focus on the enemy, sometimes we tend to alienate people and sometimes we might be keeping them from improving their own situation, keeping them from helping us catch the bad guys. So the more that we focus on the whole population, the more that we build these ties, basically make friends, win hearts and minds, the more effective we'll be finding the bad guys and we'll also be giving them a tangible improvement in their quality of life. Reporting from Kandahar Province, Afghanistan, I'm Army Sergeant Carl Greenwell. Patrols like these are beginning to transition to Afghan Army-led patrols, with U.S. soldiers taking on the role of trainers and observers. 
Another transition the Army is going through is a change in the standardization of occupational specialties for all soldiers, regardless of gender. Sergeant Larry Carter has more. 34 1st Brigade 1st Cavalry Division soldiers participated in the Army Physical Demand Study to validate and standardize tasks specific to combat engineers. The U.S. Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine, or USARIUM, reached out to combat military occupation specialty schools to identify the most physically demanding and critical aspect of each of the seven combat MOSs tested prior to the study. Carrying and employing an Anti-Personal Obstacle Breaching System, or APOBS, was one of the engineer tasks tested. The research also tested common warrior tasks like preparing a fighting position and removing a casualty from a vehicle. Ready? Go! Research Administrators Marilyn Sharp and Edward Zambraski say soldiers realized the impact the research could have on future MOS structure. They realized that this is an important issue for the Army. Okay? It's not some researcher doing research for the sake of doing research. Okay? Uh, and because this is such a high visibility and important issue, I think a lot of the soldiers uh, have a sort of a, an inherent, I really want to help this. Yeah, I mean, it's a real opportunity to um, help make your MOS stronger and safer, really. Eucerium is in its second year of the three-year project. Iron Horse soldiers' participation will help the Army choose the best qualified soldiers being selected for positions and may reduce non-combat related injuries. Reporting for 1st Brigade Combat Team, 1st Cavalry Division, I'm Army Sergeant Larry Carter. Exercise Talisman Sabre 2013, which took place in Australia, was a great training environment for U.S. soldiers. Lessons were learned as soldiers trained with their Australian counterparts. What was the takeaway? Gail McCabe fills us in with this report. We want to leave here as a capable three-star level operational headquarters for the Pacific Command AOR. Yes, sir. Major General Kenneth Dahl says Exercise Talisman Sabre is a good start. As the Deputy Commander of the Army's First Corps, he has priorities. His goals are to make sure the staff understands what they are tasked to do, whether it's here in the plans tent or in the daily operations update. I'm looking to make sure they don't have any gaps and seams in what has to be accomplished. He's also keen on recognizing the value of partners. We as Americans are not going to be able to do it uh, by ourselves. We have to partner. Uh, we have to collaborate. Talisman Sabre is a multinational training event with Australia and the U.S. operating as key participants. Are clear. It is a large-scale exercise, but according to Dahl, it's just not enough. The challenge is, is that we, we don't do them on a regular basis as we would like to. For example, Talisman Sabre is one of the largest ground joint multinational exercises in the Pacific, but we only do it every other year. A schedule that creates a sense of unfamiliarity, in a large part as a result of military rotations, which Dahl himself can speak to. Having just only arrived, it's a little dramatic, frankly. As I've told the, the staff, don't be intimidated by that. You may be new to this particular exercise in this environment, but draw upon you know, those experiences, have confidence. What he wants his soldiers to understand is the Pacific region is enormous, filled with lots of challenges, numerous partners, and a wide variety of responsibilities. Talisman Sabre, he says, is a very good start for them all. Makes a very big difference. Gil McCabe, Australia. After the break, we go to Germany and find out what it's like to be an airborne soldier. Then we go to Afghanistan to see soldiers get caught up on their combat skills. Up next on the Soldier's Journal. For official release, whistleblowers working for the Defense Department subcontractors will be under DOD contractors and subcontractors can report waste, fraud, or abuse without fear of retaliation. That's the law. Whistleblower protection has been extended to subcontractors who report possible wrongdoing. If you've witnessed waste, fraud, or abuse, visit dodig.mil to file a complaint. And that's the bottom line. Connection open. Roger that. Transfer begins. Unlike traditional injuries, applying pressure to an eye injury can actually make it worse. 
The best way to treat eye injuries is to apply a rigid eye shield, not a patch. Remember, survey, shield, seek. Survey the eye injury, shield the eye, and seek medical attention. Visit vce.health.mil for more information. A service member asks, what is the Yellow Ribbon Program and how do I apply? Colleges and universities that participate in the Yellow Ribbon Program may offer to pay a portion of your tuition not covered by the post-9-11 GI Bill, and the VA will match that amount. Search Yellow Ribbon at gibill.va.gov to find participating schools. Benefits questions? Shoot an email to yourbenefits at dma.mil. Believe it or not, the Army has been conducting vampire missions in Afghanistan. Those missions involve combat medics and helicopters. Army Sergeant Elliot Valdez explains. Hey, buddy, what happened? Can you tell me what happened? As a combat medic, treating soldiers and saving lives is what you're trained to do. And for these 2nd Brigade 1st Cavalry soldiers, there's something new to learn. Instead of training to save lives on the ground, they're learning how to save lives on an aircraft. It is a different world. You lose uh, your sense of hearing. You're working in a lot more confined space. All right, dog, it's about a 15 minute flight to the roll three, all right? You got 15 minutes. You just gotta know what you need to do. There's a process that we do when we get in the aircraft and we're just trying to teach them that. And we believe that uh, practice doesn't make perfect, but perfect practice makes permanent. So his BP is actually 90 over 60. Combat medics assisting flight medics on aircraft. The Army came up with this program to assist in uh, uh, providing better care for all of our casualties. Um, so the idea was to bring in additional medics as an asset, give them additional training, um, you know, increase the care we do give our patients. They're called back wall medics, mainly because of where they sit in the aircraft. But when it comes to giving life-saving blood, they've got a name for that, vampire. Oh, vampires are blood missions. All right, um, so now it's, uh, it's standard for all medevacs to carry blood on board. Um, when we do give a patient uh, blood, um, it's called a vampire mission. It makes training more realistic, and overall, it'll provide better care for soldiers. Everything we do is awesome. We get to do anything involving helicopters or even just when we're on the, blood, the, the IV lanes, any trauma lanes, uh, patient assessments, all of it's, it just, it's fun. I like it and it also prepares me for when I actually have a patient. So I love it. I mean, that's basically how we don't die as we talk to each other. Right. For America's first team, I'm Army Sergeant Elliot Valdez. Well done. And In part, the Airborne Creed states I am a trooper of the sky. I am my nation's best. In peace and in war, I will never fail. Anytime, any place, anywhere. I am airborne. Specialist Arthur Herring takes us to Grafenwehr, Germany, where we meet a soldier who loves to be airborne. Imagine if this was your day job. <laughs> For the soldier you're about to meet, and a select few like him, it is. Not very many people join the military, even less people go airborne. And as you can see, you get this kind of stuff going on today. It's fun. Gives you a good rush. And after his 10th jump being airborne, he says he and his teammates aren't your typical soldiers. We train differently. We train for a whole different mission set that most soldiers don't train for. Even after being in the Army for five years, he says no two days ever seem the same. So this is actually it's one of those jobs where I can wake up one day and be shooting a 50 cal machine gun or jump out of a plane or, yeah, yeah, I have a boring day every now and then, but I like, I like the pace of this job. And even though these soldiers get to jump out of planes at least four times a year, it's not all fun and games. It's a cool thing to do, but there's a lot of stress. You know, it's a lot more physically challenging. Uh, on most days, there's a lot of safety that goes into it. And while it doesn't completely eliminate the risk, it does mitigate it a lot. <laughs> and then accidents do happen too. I mean, sometimes I do just end up in the tree. And that's bad. <laughs> From Grafenwehr Training Area in Germany, I'm Specialist Arthur Herring. As we move from Germany, we go to Afghanistan, where soldiers stationed at Combat Outpost Kilige 
brushed up on some combat skills during a live fire exercise. Petty Officer Hillary Browning shows us how they used mortars and attack aircraft to destroy enemy targets. When a convoy gets attacked, soldiers have to be ready to jump into action to suppress the enemy, sometimes through the use of indirect fire. As a Ford observer, I call for fire missions on enemy objectives using mortars, artillery, aviation, and naval gunfire. Indirect fire involves firing at a target that is often not visible and requires sophisticated calculations to hit the target. We drove out the first phase line. Uh, we had a target of opportunity. They laced a target or two and then they called in a fire mission. At the next phase line, we implemented the quick fire plan. They had a gun run. Got to the last phase line where we hopped out our 60-millimeter uh, mortar gunner and fired in uh, direct lay to the enemy on the hillside. The convoy went through the exercise multiple times to improve accuracy and efficiency. First Lieutenant Lambert, who organized most of the event, ensured things ran smoothly. He also hoped to teach his team their value. My big thing was showing them, hey, you are needed. You are very, very much needed. And utilization of indirect fires, it is a needed asset. And you are a needed element in your unit. After nearly five hours of training in the sun, the unit heads home feeling confident in their skills. Petty Officer Hillary Browning, Combat Outpost Killigai, Afghanistan. Specialist James Kimball of Moore, Oklahoma, was seven years old when his current National Guard unit responded to the May 3, 1999 tornado. Now a veteran of Afghanistan, he was called to active duty to assist with the tornado search and rescue that again struck his hometown of Moore this past May. Sergeant Vincent Donaldson brings us his story. It was really similar. The, the sights you see from, from damaged homes from the war, uh, almost matches up with damaged homes from a tornado. Specialist James Kimball of Moore, Oklahoma, returned from Afghanistan a year ago, having deployed as a member of the 45th Infantry Brigade Combat Team. A lot of the smells are the same. Basically, the, the same helplessness in people's eyes are the same as well. In one career, he wears the uniform of a disciplined soldier, a warfighter. Being a warfighter, you're fighting against an enemy. In the other, the uniform of a skilled employee. Being an assistant soldier, you're helping out with your community. I know every time I put on this uniform that I know that I'll possibly be swapping out that uniform the same day. As a citizen of the community of Moore, devastated by a tornado May 20th, the call came once again to change uniforms and render aid to his stricken neighbors, as had the same National Guard unit done for his family at the May 3rd, 1999 tornado when Kimball was seven years old. I remember when the May 3rd tornado came through, I was living in Bridge Creek in Bravo 179 was in my t hometown helping out and I always thought it'd be real cool to do the same thing they was doing. I was with them on deployment and now I'm here helping out my hometown, same units. As civilian authorities regained control, streets cleared of wreckage, Specialist Kimball again changed uniforms. The job of a soldier done, Kimball returned to that of a citizen. When I put this uniform on, I know it's mainly to help me survive, help pay the bills, uh, that other uniform, that, that's to serve my community, that's to serve America and my state. For the Oklahoma National Guard, I'm Army Master Sergeant Vincent Donaldson. After the break, we'll go around the Army to see soldiers assist those stranded by the Colorado floods. And we'll see soldiers from Canada and the UK converge on Fort Stewart. Right now, there are soldiers and their families going through some tough times. Every member of our Army family is expected to take care of each other. This fall, we have the opportunity to help those in need by contributing to the combined federal campaign. More than 2,500 organizations rely on your support. I'm so proud of your commitment to the Army and your support to this very important program. Army strong. You can now make your same-sex spouse your beneficiary under the Survivor Benefit Plan. Same-sex spouses of service members and retirees are now eligible beneficiaries. However, enrollment is not automatic. You must enroll in the Survivor Benefit Plan. See your personnel office or visit militarypay.defense.gov. 
And that's what's happening on the home front. As we go around the Army, we travel to Georgia, Indiana, and Hawaii. But first, we go to Colorado. More than 750 members of the Colorado National Guard responded to flooding throughout central Colorado. Helicopters from the U.S. Army and Colorado and Wyoming National Guards took to the air, fanning out across the region to rescue people stranded across hundreds of square miles. Intense rainfall pushed streams out of their banks and sent walls of water crashing down mountain canyons. Thousands of people and hundreds of pets have been rescued due to the efforts by the National Guard. Fort Stewart, Georgia. 2,300 Georgia Guardsmen, including soldiers from Canada and the United Kingdom, converged on the Regional Training Center at Fort Stewart. The Georgia National Guard's 48th Infantry Brigade Combat Team set high marks for the Exportable Combat Training Capability, or XCTC. The program provides soldiers with an experience similar to combat missions overseas. The mission of the XCTC is to gain a better perspective into the actions of platoons in a field environment. Camp Atterbury, Indiana. Soldiers of the Indiana National Guard's 2150 Field Artillery took part in a live fire event during Bold Quest 13.2. The purpose of the live fire was to assist French and Norwegian forces in digitally transmitting a call for fire between coalition systems. Over 1,000 participants from 13 different countries participated to assess close air support technologies along with tactics, techniques, and procedures, which will help reduce friendly fire incidents, enhance combat effectiveness, and increase situational awareness. Honolulu, Hawaii. Four laps around a track to beat a world record. That is just what First Lieutenant Ashley Sorensen did when she donned the 75-pound EOD suit at the University of Hawaii's track and field. She set out to set the female world record for the fastest one-mile bomb disposal suit runtime. The current record runtime is 1347, and she beat it by more than two and a half minutes. Coming in at a cool 1106. The Guinness Book of World Records will review the runtime before it becomes official. And that's a look around the Army. After the break, we go to Afghanistan, where soldiers are looking kind of sketchy. In today's Army, it's more important than ever to know the signs you or your buddies are at risk. Hi, I'm Gary Sinise. After every visit I make with the troops here in the States or overseas, I'm always struck by how deeply you care for one another. You know who has your back outside the wire, but what about in the thick of the fight at home? Accidents remain the number one killer of soldiers during their off-duty time. Compounding the tragedy is that in almost every instance, someone will have seen the signs that a soldier was in trouble long before the laws. Know the signs of risky behavior. Drinking too much, speeding, driving without a seat belt, riding without personal protective equipment. Your challenge now is to act on them. Whether it's you or your buddy, make the effort, both your family and theirs, are counting on you to do the right thing and bring everyone home. Know the signs. Know what's right. Do what's right. I'm Major Ed Polito, United States Army, retired. We had just finished a mission, and as I was driving, I hit an IED. I experienced post-traumatic issues related to the experience, and then when they took my leg away, I actually thought about taking my life. What changed was I began to reach out for support and to think about all these things need to be talked about. And so I began my recovery and to see that my life wasn't over and that I could conquer my challenge. Something is drawing soldiers to the USO at Kandahar Airfield in Afghanistan. Specialist Jovi Prevost illustrates the story. 
A group of cartoonists traveled to Kandahar Airfield, Afghanistan to personally thank service members. These honored guests are members of the National Cartoonist Society and represent various magazines, comic strips, and newspapers. The cartoonist's care and attention was completely concentrated on one subject, the soldiers. And all we really want to do is just meet, meet you guys and draw. You know, and, it, and everybody, and I mean, our, we're not sacrificing anything. You know, we're just, we're on a trip, you know, we hang out together, we're drawing people, we do what we love. But, uh, uh, but nobody, I mean, everybody just is so um, excited about being able to do it. As part of this USO sponsored event, the artists drew personalized sketches for each of the troops. When soldiers saw their cartoon, the response was absolutely animated. It's kind of funny at first how another person views you, I guess, but after looking at it for a little bit, I'm like, yep, I can see that. As the last cartoons were signed, the event that brought an appreciated morale boost cheerfully ended. Specialist Jovi Prevo, Kandahar Airfield, Afghanistan. Before we leave, we'd like to show you this photo of Chief Warrant Officer Mike Eager and Chief Warrant Officer 4, Troy Parmley, both pilots with the Colorado National Guard as they fly a UH-72 Lakota helicopter over flooded areas as part of relief and recovery operations near Fort Collins, Colorado. You can see many more photos of our Army by going to our Facebook page at the address you see on the screen. And look for us throughout the week with the latest in news about the Army on Soldiers Update. Also, check us out on the radio with Soldiers Radio News on the American Forces Radio Network. That does it for this edition of the Soldiers Journal. Join us again next time for the stories all about you, the soldier.